Hi, everyone. We'll be starting the, the next session in uh, two minutes. All right, good afternoon, everyone. We're gonna we're gonna kick off this session. Uh, if I could ask everyone to take their seats. Uh, thank you for joining us today for this IGF session, this open forum on multi-stakeholder and cybersecurity. The title of this session is Cybersecurity 2.0: Leveraging the Multi-Stakeholder Model to Develop and Deploy Cybersecurity Policy. Now, um, my name is Lea Kaspar. I'll be moderating uh, today's session. And we have today with us a number of expert speakers who will be sharing their views and experiences on this topic. Um, next to me here we have uh, Mr. Jonah Hill, policy specialist from the US Department of Commerce. Um, then next to him, Mr. Amit Ashkenazi, from, uh, who's a legal advisor um, at the National Cyber Directorate of Israel. Um, next to him we have uh, um, Alison Gilwald, the Executive Director of uh, Research ICT Africa and Professor at the University of Cape Town. Um, I see Ambassador Fikin next to her, uh, who is the, so Dr. Dr. Fikin is an um, uh, Australian Ambassador for Cyber Affairs. Um, and uh, last but not least, we have Jan Neutze over there from Microsoft. Um, really happy to have uh, all of them today with us. So before, uh, before I turn to them uh, for, for their remarks, just a few words on the framing and the objectives for the session. As you will have, will have seen from the title, we are dealing with, uh, we'll be tackling two concepts, multi-stakeholderism and cybersecurity that um, if, I, I'm guessing if we made a, a word cloud of IGF 2017, you know, they'd probably find their way into the top 10. Um, but as with many, internet governance buzzwords, and I think there are probably as many definitions of these terms as there are IGF participants. And in fact, um, a mapping done by the New America Foundation found and identified that uh, at the moment over 400 definitions of cybersecurity that they've captured. Um, and uh, on the multi-stakeholder side, I think that uh, you know, there are as many views on what, what it means as there, as there are people you ask. So despite these conceptual challenges, um, what, we're, what we've been seeing recently has been an increasing commitment to dealing with cybersecurity challenges through a multi-stakeholder approach. So what, and the, what we'll be dealing with here is not so much the theory uh, of, of these concepts, but what they mean in practice, how do we implement them? Um, there are a number of, um, of stakeholders around the world who are looking to deal with cybersecurity challenges. 
Um, but going beyond just saying, yes, we need to do this in a multi-stakeholder way, what is the actual what does the actual approach and implementation look like? So what we'll do today um, to allow us to do this, we'll first, I'll first invite a couple of our panelists to reflect their views shortly on what we understand as multi-stakeholders and cybersecurity, just to kind of narrow down the scope for the discussion, um, after which we'll proceed to discuss um, best practice and examples of good practice in implementing, implementing this approach specifically at the national level, um, and uh, we'll reflect a little bit on the on incentives and some of the challenges of doing this. Um, after that, I'm going to turn to you. So uh, we'll, we're going to have a question and answer segment. And I'll be asking not just for questions to the panel, but also your own uh, views on, on uh, best practice. And if you have examples of how multi-stakeholder approaches can be implemented to deal with cybersecurity challenges, it would be great to capture that as well. Uh, finally, I'll uh, come back to the panel to see um, for, for, for a round of takeaways and, and to wrap up the panel. So we only have one hour for this session, um, I'll, so I'll have to be a strict timekeeper and I apologize uh, in advance if I in, in interrupt anyone. It will be um, strictly in order to keep us on time. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to start us off and to help us frame the conversation, invite two of our speakers to offer their views on what we mean by in turn cybersecurity and the multi-stakeholder approach. And first I'm gonna to turn to uh, Mr. Ashkenazi. If you could help us narrow down the concept of cybersecurity for the purpose of this discussion, what do we mean when we, when we talk about cybersecurity? If you could offer your, your reflections on, in like four to five minutes, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. So. Uh it's uh, very exciting to be here in this discussion, um, and I want to share with you the way that uh, the Israeli government frames the cybersecurity discussion and a policy within the domestic context. And the first thing to note uh, is that the government is uh, looking at this issue because um, basically cybersecurity threats are threats that uh, affect private networks, private organizations. This is not the usual security scenario where you have borders or public spaces that uh, the government can uh, provide security in, and the government is called in to assist and perform its, uh, I would say, um, almost a basic role as provider of security. This is why we have states in the first place. And when it moves to um, do this uh, task, which is uh, expected by the citizens and the constituencies, it needs to take, uh, uh, take into account the complexity of performing security with, with uh, uh, constituencies which are private organizations and across uh, the, the, the nation. And uh, the Israeli strategy looks at this, uh, this um, task uh, through an interface of relationships which the government has within the domestic cybersecurity mission. The first, uh, the first part of the, the strategy is institutional, to set up a new organization which is role is to deal with cybersecurity and to deal with cyber attacks before we can know and deal with the cyber attackers. So this is something that the state has to do in order to assist organizations. The WannaCry event is an event in which uh, I think a, a lot of leaders around the world ask themselves what are we doing in our, uh, in, in our country and what, what is the situation? It's not uh, who are we calling, who is controlling, who knows what is going on. And in that context in Israel, there was one person uh, that could report to the Prime Minister and discuss what are the measures that are being taken um, to mitigate this type of uh, event. And uh, this type of relationship with the private sector uh, is um, uh, based on two types of elements. One is the more straightforward role of government as creating standards and incentives through different mechanisms. It can be regulation and it can be other techniques to make organizations more secure. Sometimes uh, managers do not internalize the risks of their activities to third parties or their activities to the ecosystem. We saw that in WannaCry. You can, it was spreading very fastly and not one corporation uh, which didn't maybe patch its systems caused a, a problem to other organizations in the ecosystem. And the other part, which is a, a, a more, a, a more a new, novel type of concept, is the role of the government in mitigating the attack. This is a firefighting metaphor, some of you may know, that before we deal with the attackers, we need to mitigate the attack and, um, uh, and make sure that damage doesn't occur uh, as a result of the attack. And we know that organizations 
cannot uh, deal with this situation by themselves. We've seen a lot of strong organizations around the world, uh, not talking about small, medium enterprises being hit and uh, they need assistance. And in this role, the government has an important task, which I, I think I'll elaborate to in the next part, to create information sharing mechanisms and to collaborate uh, uh, early detection systems and also to share information about how to mitigate the attacks. This is a public good that until now in many countries there isn't a provision of and uh, the way the, this, uh, the information security, um, I would say discipline has developed requires now for uh, more uh, government intervention in this space. Last thing uh, I, should, uh, I should mention is that uh, what we're focused on is attacks. This is talking about bad code indicators. We're focusing on machines and what machines are doing. We're not focusing on human behavior on top of these uh, machines. And indeed, we are not um, neglecting the attention to the attackers. But for that, we have existing institutions within our system, as in many countries. So if it's a national security threat, it will be dealt with by the national security establishment, law enforcement by law enforcement, etc. But notwithstanding those important roles, there is a new uh, role for government here to interface with the private sector in order to create cyber security. Thank you. Thank you, Amit, for, for, for those remarks or for helping us frame the discussion. Um, and uh, I, I might come back to, to the question of what we mean by cybersecurity later, later on in the session. But I'd like to turn now to, to Mr. Hill. Jonah, if you could offer us uh, your views on, on the multi-stakeholder approach. Um, you've actually written a, a couple of papers and co-drafted co papers on the application of the multi-stakeholder approach in cybersecurity. And I'm interested in hearing um, what are some of the characteristics that define it? What do we actually mean by it? Um, so yeah, please, Great. over uh, to you. Thank you, thank you, Leia. Um, so uh, in a moment, um, you know, we're gonna talk about the practical applications of the multi-stakeholder approach uh, to different cybersecurity challenges. Um, but I guess it would be useful before we go there to talk a little bit about what a multi-stakeholder approach is um, as, as a matter of theory. Um, you know, as Leah said, there is um, sort of a lot of diversity uh, uh, in the use of the term multi-stakeholder and, and it has become sort of a buzzword, um, but it does actually mean something and it does uh, actually have a real practical application. Um, so while, you know, different organizations and, and um, uh, under different circumstances, um, the term multi-stakeholder might um, you know, mean different things to different groups. Um, for us at the Department of Commerce, um, we've tried to actually hone in on the core elements of a multi-stakeholder approach. Um, and these are core elements that we've applied to our domestic uh, cybersecurity work. Um, so most importantly, I'll, you know, I'll walk through uh, quickly what those features are, but uh, most importantly, uh, we've found that uh, uh, authentic or a um, sort of the a multi-stakeholder approach that is um, most um, effective is one that is stakeholder driven. Um, and this means that uh, the organization convening a multi-stakeholder process or uh, a venue that is facilitating a multi-stakeholder initiative um, isn't the one that actually ultimately decides where the process goes. Um, that it's the participants themselves uh, that ultimately make the final decisions about what is uh, done, what are the issues that are tackled, um, and that while governments or the conveners may um, certainly have, a, a, an, uh, have input and have an opinion, um, it's not the convener that's making the decision, it's the stakeholders themselves. Um, second, uh, and equally important, is that uh, a multi-stakeholder approach uh, multi-stakeholder approach needs to be open. Um, so that means that all stakeholders um, can participate. Um, and importantly, this, the, the stakeholders that participate um, should be ones that hold specialized expertise uh, that's applicable to the, the challenge at hand. So um, while anyone should join, it's really important that people who are experts in the particular challenge are participating. And that doesn't mean they need to hold a particular viewpoint, but they should know what they're talking about. Um, so it's, uh, it's important to keep uh, discussion open and it's important to keep uh, 
the participants diverse, um, but it's also important that those uh, who are there in a particular process um, are able to contribute. Uh, third, it's uh, critically important that a multi-stakeholder approach is transparent. Um, and that means that anyone can have access to the deliberations, whether uh, that's transcripts of the um, discussions like we have here, um, that uh, you know, there are videos for folks who can't participate to watch uh, from streaming online. Um, and this really helps create an environment of trust. It creates an environment of legitimacy and accountability that um, these aren't meetings held behind closed doors where uh, you know, there are secret decisions being made, but these are uh, processes where everyone um, can see what's happening. Uh, and if there's something that uh, you, know, you disagree with, that you, know, you can have your voice heard. Um, and lastly, um, this is something that I think is um, you know, maybe more controversial, but um, is something that I think we uh, at the Department of Commerce find to be uh, critical is that uh, the ultimate decisions and outcomes of these processes, uh, if there are outcomes, uh, are consensus based. Mm -hmm. So uh, you don't vote. Um, you know, this should be a consensus, whether that's a rough consensus or un uniformity, um, uh, about the final outcome. So that means that you, know, you get compromise um, and you need something that's a win-win for the greatest number uh, of stakeholders um, and while you know that may prevent some of the more contentious issues being addressed it actually may address uh, more effectively some of the more contentious issues um, but it's important that all stakeholders walk away from these processes mm -hmm. feeling like their voices were heard um, and that ultimately they were um, you know c content with the end result so those are really the, the four features, uh, stakeholder driven, open, transparent, and consensus based that we think are uh, critical. Thank you, Jonah. And what I particularly like about that approach is that, and what it shows, and perhaps we, uh, it shows that our title of the session might be a little bit misleading because we, we, uh, we were talking about the multi-stakeholder model, whereas actually from what you're saying is in fact that depending on potentially what issue you're dealing with, you might apply these characteristics in a different way. Um, and that's certainly our, our experience as well in dealing with, with uh, in, in this space. Um, so what I'd like to do now is, uh, as, and as we've said in the beginning, what we're seeing is increased commitments to this approach in dealing with cybersecurity challenges that Amit has uh, laid out at the beginning. Um, however, I think unlike in the field of internet governance where the approach itself has become part and parcel of dealing with internet governance challenges, in cybersecurity, examples of good practice are still rare and far apart. Uh, so what we'd like to do now is talk a little bit about um, some of those examples and how um, first some of the governments have been um, applying the approach at the national level. And first I'd like to go to Ambassador Fikin uh, to share the experience from Australia. Sure. I'm, so, so thank you for that. Um, how, I'll, I'll think best about how to follow up rather than give a kind of stock speech to it. Um, if I c maybe can talk a bit about um, the, the position that I hold and how we thought long and hard about how the position could embody that multi-stakeholderism in addressing the challenges that we were going to be faced with through our international cyber engagement. Um, <clears throat> the, the position itself, as I said, we sat at the beginning of the year when I landed in January. Um, and, and we're thinking, how could this position embody that? And I think in some ways I was at an advantage having come from outside of government and sat in a think tank, where in a think tank you kind of live or die by the engagement that, that we could have um, across a broad range of sectors. Could we, sorry, could we just shut the doors? It's quite mm -hmm. off-putting. Um, <clears throat> um, and, and, and the idea being is that you know, in a think tank, you, you live or die by your engagement with the private sector, with other NGOs, with academia, to ensure that you're being influenced as well as just by government and getting that broad range of perspectives. So um, we, we thought, okay, how can this position, how can our international engagement be shaped like that? Multi-stakeholderism is at the heart of how Australia um, looks as it, at its international engagement. Um, we do a range of things at a domestic level on a, a more cybersecurity practical level, which I can talk about in a moment, perhaps in the Q&A. Um, but in our international engagement, something that we wanted to do was, um, you know, we, we, I laid on the table, we had an issue, our internet governance forum had, had stopped, um, and we realized we needed to re-energize that, and we thought, well, how as government can we assist and make sure that it influences what we're doing? 
So, so we've committed ourselves through our international engagement strategy to a new internet governance and cooperation forum. And we felt the cooperation part was the really important bit because that's where we as government can take our agenda to an internet governance forum in Australia, share some of the priorities for the year and ensure that the sessions and some of the discussions can have a flavor of our prioritization so that we can really draw from the broader community of thought, um, not just go with the sole government position. Um, it, it's, it's good practice, I think. It's a way of embodying multi-stakeholderism. When you stand up at an international meeting and say, you know, we're all about multi-stakeholderism, well, you're embodying it if you've been through a process like that. So we think it's a, a pretty powerful thing to do. So we'll be hosting that um, next year. Um, we, we work with a whole range of private sector partners through the process of developing an international engagement strategy, but also now uh, one of the ways that we're doing that for this position is, is having an industry advisory group who will meet at the beginning of a year and again talk about prioritization and, and how, um, how, how our prioritization is viewed from a private sector point of view and help shape and um, um, influence that. And then also meet at the end of the year and I, I keep putting myself up for these checks and balances. I'll probably regret it at the end of the day, but at the end of the year to meet again and understand how well have we done against those objectives. How could we tweak and, and look at the um, prioritization for the following year um, following that. So in that way, again, having a broader set of stakeholders influence um, this position and also the, the, the positions that Australia is taking um, in, in international settings. Um, another way that we're doing that is by understanding that we, we feel that there's a prioritization we need to place on capacity building. But just understanding that we can't, we can't do any of it alone. It has to be in that multi-stakeholder um, form. And one of the things that we did when we launched the strategy was to launch a range of private sector partnerships um, and partnerships with academia, with, with other non-governmental organizations, um, some of whom are in the room today. Um, but, but we have major projects launched with Qantas, so with the aviation industry, with major Australian banks, um, and, a, and a range of other tech companies. Um, to, to because they have so much capability to offer and where national, economic and social, broader social interests merge, well then it's, it's quite obvious that you should be working together as long as that's done in a sensitive way to the, uh, the, the, the region that you're, you're um, doing the capacity building work in. Um, so, so we feel that also is, is a really important area of um, the work that we do. Um, very, very briefly, and then I'll be quiet because I'm sure time is coming to a close. How do we do that at a domestic level? Well, at a very practical delivering cybersecurity level, one thing we've realized is that um, we, we were too classified in what we were doing at our Australian cybersecurity center. So we physically relocated the center to a less classified environment to ensure that it was far easier for academia, for private sector, for just a broader range of straight stakeholders who understand the technical details of cybersecurity who wouldn't have been able to engage us with this in the past can now do that. We've also opened up regional hubs where, again, we have less classified areas so there's more collaboration space. Um, and, and it's, you know, it's, a, it's basically government saying that we don't have all the answers, but we want to create the environment where perhaps together we can come up with some solutions together. So we're trying to provide that, that working environment where we can embody, again, that multi-stakeholderism because we know we'll gain so much more from that kind of approach than just trying to pretend that we have all the answers. Thank you so, thank you so much, Ambassador. Um, and uh, uh, later when we come to the q and I would really like to tease out some of the examples from other countries that I know have been developing their national cybersecurity strategies in a multi-stakeholder way. I think it would be really interesting to see and kind of maybe compare and contrast how different, um, how, how different contexts you know, are, um, uh, are applying this model approach. Um, if I may come to, um, come to um, back to Amit, to you, to, to, you mentioned to me earlier today when we, when we talked about this, a really interesting, um, interesting approach uh, or I issue and, uh, that you're looking at through a multi-stakeholder approach in Israel. Maybe could you, could you maybe elaborate a little bit on that? Sure. So I'll give a practical example of the issue that uh, everyone uh, dealing with cybersecurity knows about, the issue of information sharing. And uh, as the government, and you should note that the government here, um, the renewed role of the government in this space uh, requires uh, some innovation from the government because uh, security information has been around always uh, and it's passed around. The question is what is the added value of the government and what can the government do to assist this type of operation. And uh, we developed our uh, thinking through the multi-stakeholder approach 
Um, it is a government-led approach, but it has several uh, elements on the technical level, on the content level, and if you like, on the legal level from the trust uh, point of view, and I'll, I'll mention all of these. The first thing that uh, we saw was the need to create a platform in which uh, companies can share information securely. Um, so uh, we uh, took the example of uh, creating, I would say, a social network for cyber security professionals called CyberNet. And it's open to companies and to their security people, and it's uh, secure, and we are the moderators there, so we can have very, very quick uh, information exchanges. So we, we created the platform. And the second thing that we did around that platform was uh, create trust in the rules of the use of the platform so companies can understand what's going to be done both within their communities, so they have specific communities which are contextual for specific sectors, and there are also other uh, more open forums for uh, broader type of trust, uh, uh, I would say, signals. And, um, and it's, it's clear that the information shared within this network is shared for the cybersecurity mission. It's not an alternative to mandatory reporting that some sectors may have to government in other regulatory roles. And um, the, the multi-stakeholder model uh, allowed this to develop a uh, bottom-up. Um, like maybe you know the traffic um, uh, application, very popular Israeli traffic application called Waze, which is based basically on people reporting their positions and then you can understand where you have traffic jams. So it's the same type of thinking working here in the cybersecurity space, but the, the need for the government to intervene was to create the platform to make sure it's secure and to create a trust by setting the rules of the road for the use of this platform, and it's uh, quite useful today both for sector-specific uh, information sharing and uh, between the sectors and our national CERT as part of uh, the cybersecurity mission. Thank you, thank you. I think it's a really interesting and kind of a little bit of a different uh, um, example of what I kind of think about when, when we think about applying the multi-stakeholder approach. I, I, my, my hat always goes to thinking, always goes to developing national cybersecurity strategies, you know, but I think this is an excellent example of how the model, if you will, is adaptable and flexible. Um, and I'd like to come to um, Jonah, you next. I know that the NTIA, so the U.S. Department of Commerce, has experimented with the model to deal with a couple of issues. So could you give us, um, give us some background on that um, in a couple of minutes? So what are the, uh, how did you do that? How did it work? Um, and, you know, value for the, um, the value from a government perspective of doing it in a multi-stakeholder way? Uh, sure, yeah, so I know we're, we're short on time, so I'll try to keep it short, um, and I'm happy to talk with anyone after this um, if they're interested in more details. Um, so uh, my home agency, NTIA, and the Department of Commerce has a long history of uh, participating and fostering multi-stakeholder initiatives. Um, NTIA was uh, instrumental in the creation of, of ICANN um, back in the late 90s, um, and really sort of takes uh, the multi-stakeholder approach to heart um, and has um, tried to adapt the model um, and experiment with it in um, emerging public policy issues. Um, uh, and for the last several years, we've been working on a number of uh, technology and privacy uh, public policy issues um, using a multi-stakeholder approach and uh, as of 2015 have started experimenting with um, the approach and uh, a number of cybersecurity challenges for industry. Um, so I can talk a little bit about how the process worked um, and some of the initiatives that we've been working on. Um, so back in March 2015, uh, we issued uh, what is called a request for comments. It's a formal federal government um, notification process where we basically put out an open-ended question saying, um, if, uh, you know, if for any interested party, which is, uh, you know, cybersecurity vendors, uh, software providers, um, the research community, hackers even, um, what are those uh, cybersecurity policy issues where a multi-stakeholder approach might be beneficial? Um, and we received uh, dozens um, of responses um, from all those groups, um, helping us to identify various issues. Um, and we had a list of about 12 or so uh, public policy challenges that uh, the community thought would be uh, valuable uh, to explore through this approach. Um, the first one uh, that we 
uh, concluded about a year ago was on vulnerability disclosure. Um, I can talk uh, a little bit more about that if anybody would uh, wants to sort of hear about what we did there, but this was, again, a open, transparent, consensus-driven process where uh, actually we believe for the first time hackers and the vendor community came together to come up with public policy solutions for best practices for vulnerability disclosure. Um, and this was uh, really about um, you know, how do uh, uh, vendors um, communicate their vulnerability disclosure, uh, what are the best practices, um, how do you come up with uh, standards that um, can be um, widely uh, used across different uh, types of software providers. Um, uh, after that, we, we focused on um, IoT and uh, patchability. Um, and the point here was to really foster a market um, that offered more devices and systems that support security upgrades. Um, and importantly, uh, developing best practices for consumer awareness and understanding. Um, you know, most consumers, when they buy an IoT device, don't really know uh, whether or not there are upgrades and patches um, that you can download for the device. Um, so what we did is we brought together the IoT industry, um, we brought together uh, privacy advocates, uh, hackers, uh, to figure out um, how should we inform consumers about this. And we came out with a, uh, a series of documents providing best practices for vendors um, to make sure that we have an informed uh, community of, of consumers um, when purchasing IoT devices. Um, and again, I'm happy to talk with folks about that. Um, and lastly, uh, we're about to start a new process um, on software component transparency. Um, and the idea here is to promote transparency of third-party software components, including uh, open source software. So for instance, uh, you know, when you buy software as an enterprise or even a consumer, uh, you don't necessarily know what GitHub libraries are included. You don't really know what you're getting. Um, so you know, this is uh, a process to try to figure out how do you communicate to uh, consumers um, and to uh, you know, enterprises that are buying software what's in the software they're buying and um, how might they best mitigate the risk of, of any kind of uh, vulnerabilities that are included in those, uh, those purchases. Um, so basically the point is that you know, we are trying to, we use the multi-stakeholder process to identify public policy issues um, that weren't being addressed in other places and that really only could be addressed through cooperation between all the, the parties that were uh, interested. So um, we found the process to be really effective. There's been challenges, of course, and I'm happy to talk about those. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know, this has been a really adaptable model that's um, provided for um, you know, overall better cybersecurity across the industry. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Jenna. And uh, I think what we've heard now are three examples in which, um, in which we have, uh, where the government was the convener. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. And uh, as we know, with the different stakeholders who are critical in, um, in maintaining uh, the infrastructure and um, effectively securing the, securing the, the systems and, and networks that we are talking about, um, I'd like to come to Jan. Uh, Noitze from Microsoft next to talk a little bit about your uh, experiences. Um, I mean, the, the focus here is on good practice, and I know that Microsoft has been engaged not only in their, your internal practices applying the model, but also participating in a number, number of processes that have been convened by other stakeholders. If you can maybe uh, give us a couple of examples, in a, in, uh, I'm going to try and keep it to four minutes if that's, if that's feasible. Thanks. Okay, I'll try, I'll try for, for four minutes. Thanks, thanks, Leah, and thanks very much for having me um, on, the, on the panel. Um, I, I think I'll start with a slightly broader um, uh, sort of overview of, of what we are perceiving in terms of developments on, on cybersecurity um, approaches and policy and regulation. Uh, it's, it's quite interesting, you know, our team did a little bit of um, uh, mapping in this space, and we're, we're currently in a situation where over 100 countries in the world are developing some form of cybersecurity strategy, policy, or, or regulation. And there's a total of, of, of over 300 of these initiatives going on uh, as, as, as we speak, where countries are implementing either, either updating an existing strategy, writing a new strategy, um, implementing uh, a policy, or, or actually setting regulatory uh, specifics. And uh, from our perspective, that, that, is, that is generally a good thing because we do think 
and we need to pay a lot more attention to how we actually try and stem this tide of, of cybersecurity challenges and certainly regulation and policy play an important role in this. But given that the title of our panel is sort of, you know, multi-stakeholder approaches, we think it is vitally important that these debates are actually um, well informed by uh, a larger group of stakeholders than just governments. And I think I just want to echo what my colleagues on this panel have, have said. If you take the simple fact that 80 to 90 percent of the world's critical infrastructure, which tends to be the main focus of many of these initiatives, is owned, operated, and maintained by the private sector, mm -hmm. you inherently have a dynamic where you have to have cooperation between those that um, are in the regulatory uh, seat and those that are running these systems. Uh, and so uh, in, in that context, I think there are a number of interesting initiatives in the past years that are worthwhile looking at in terms of how that multi-stakeholder approach and collaboration has, has taken place. And I'll sort of flag two. One is <clears throat> much more of a bottom-up uh, uh, approach, and, and this is the, uh, the NIST cybersecurity framework. Um, and uh, I think, you know, from our perspective, I'm not sure how familiar people in the room are with, with, with that framework, originally uh, proposed in, 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 uh, in 2014. Um, that framework, while coordinated by um, the U.S. government, actually brought together numerous different stakeholders uh, to the table to really sit down and think about what are the main elements of an effective risk management framework to tackle cyber threats. Um, there was lots of opportunity for input, um, a, a lot of discussion on how that should be shaped. And interestingly, that framework, since it was adopted, and it's now currently actually being revised, as uh, was discussed, we uh, have seen that framework fairly quickly become a global um, a global best practice to, 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 to at least some degree, where you have enterprises outside the U.S., many enterprises in Europe, but also some in the Asia-Pacific region, take that model and, and implement it. Maybe not one for one, but generally speaking, take that approach that the NIST uh, framework proposes, um, where you have sort of a set of, of high-level functions in terms of protection, detection, respond, recovery, and then a number of sort of security um, uh, objectives or specifics uh, that allow you to uh, ultimately m measure your, your sort of cybersecurity maturity, at least to a certain degree. There, there, are, there are ways to iterate on that and build on that. But broadly speaking, it's something that um, is not only well understood by organizations and enterprises of different sizes, it's also under, easy to understand uh, not only by the technical folks doing cybersecurity, but also by sort of the, the board level and, and, and the decision maker level. And so we, we believe that's, a, that's fundamentally a very, very good model. It was derived in a good way, and it is, uh, there's a huge opportunity to implement that, uh, broadly speaking. There's actually, in fact, an ISO standard that's currently be the, being developed on the basis of that framework. And so we think that is a, actually a very interesting approach to kind of help globalize that, that model. The other approach is, is something a little closer to home here in Europe, where um, you have the NIS directive, the Network Information Security Directive, uh, much more of a top-down regulatory approach, but uh, also fairly interesting because it is the first time that the European Union has sort of uh, agreed on a cybersecurity regulation, or a directive in this case, but with a regulatory approach. Um, and in that context, I'll say that I think it was incredibly difficult for 28 member states at first to come together to agree on a set of um, uh, rules that uh, are sort of borderline in the national security space for which the EU doesn't have any competence and borderline in tr about protecting the, the digital economy in Europe. But what they ultimately ended up doing is to kind of say, look, we, need, we really have two constituencies that we're talking to. One, we need to require governments to do certain things, and that is require governments to have a national cybersecurity strategy, have gov governments need to have a, a national cybersecurity um, emergency response team, uh, and then we need to require industry to do certain things, and that is to put in place some baseline risk management measures uh, and, and also um, report serious incidents to their national regulators. And while that generally is, a, a, I think, a, a really interesting approach and a helpful approach in terms of uh, building capacity in the region. Uh, what is important, I think, to, to be mindful of, and again, this goes not just for Europe, but also more broadly, as we have either these 28 countries or these 
over 100 countries developing these initiatives, there is a risk of some fragmentation in the approach. And ultimately, you know, I think there, when you talk to folks that are practicing this and, and, are, and, are, and are implementing cyber risk management measures and policies, um, there's not necessarily a need to, to, to reinvent the wheel 100 times over. And so we have been asking ourselves, what opportunities are there to kind of uh, harmonize some, some of these approaches, mm -hmm. um, benefiting from, 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 from the experience of the multi-stakeholder community and, and bring some kind of coherence to, to this. And so in this context, we feel like initiatives that look at the how of cybersecurity, like the NIST cybersecurity framework, actually present a good opportunity to be kind of uh, formatted and, and, and fitted into um, potential sort of regulatory approaches, policies, and, and strategies that are being developed um, at, at, at sort of a, a higher level. Mm -hmm. and, and so from our end, really, I think there needs to be um, strong multi-stakeholder input into, into, into getting, getting to these frameworks, but then there needs to be a lot of attention paid by, by governments, but also by industry, uh, to make sure we have some level of, of, of harmonizing um, the implementation of, of these strategies. And so I think those are just some experiences we've seen um, in, in, in recent years, and, and we're working very closely with a number of governments to help them sort of understand what, 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 uh, what works for us, how we keep ourselves secure, and for example, how we implement something like the NIST cybersecurity framework as a company. So. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jan. Um, and um, not to give the wrong impression, I think that um, what our speakers have given us so far are excellent examples of where, um, you know, and positive examples of how the multi-stakeholder approach could be applied. Um, what it's, what's, what's important to highlight, though, are as well some of the challenges of, of doing so. And uh, for anyone who has been involved in a multi-stakeholder uh, process, you know, you know that it, it can be time, it can be time-consuming, it can be costly, it might not apply to um, to all issues and. There isn't a, a checkbox. Ex it's not a checkbox exercise. So, uh, and uh, it's, I think, as well, innovative from a perspective of governance and a lot of um, governing. I think government-driven um, policies are. Um, you know, th there's a struggle to implement it because it's just different from how policy has been developed. Um, I'm going to put that out there. Don't know, uh, see some some doubts maybe. Uh, but what I what I like to what I like to do now is go over to Alison Gilwald, and um, maybe give us a reality check on uh, you know is, is this just um, a nice idea? Um, you're based in South Africa. I'd be really interested in hearing some of your experiences from the African continent and and how this applies. Thank you very much. Yes. yes. Um, thank you very much. Um, I am executive director of an organization called Research ICT Africa, which is a South African-based think tank that does ICT policy and regulation across the African continent, um, working very closely with partners in 20 countries. But um, I want to preface my remarks by saying, you know, Africa isn't a country, which is often how we sort of refer to it. It's, it's very diverse and it's difficult to speak about it in any kind of homogenous way. But I do want to just draw out some general points and then I'll go to some specific cases maybe just to give it some, some you know, um, a nuance. Um, so the first point I wanted to make is that the, the, the challenge with many of these um, internet governance frameworks, the challenges with the um, international treaties and what are presented as best practice is that they are underpinned by um, assumptions around um, <coughs> rule of law, democracy. Um, they are underpinned by assumptions of um, competitive markets, um, effective you know, regulation, um, institutional capacity, um, you know, user consumer awareness. Um, so um, basically the, one of the fundamental problems is that these assumptions cannot simply be um, drawn through into practices of um, internet governance and of um, uh, cybersecurity in particular, um, because you know they, they they simply don't apply. That being said, um, you know I think there is um, value in a multi-stakeholder approach, um, in the sense that you know it can just be lip service. So we can all just say, okay, we're all doing that, and there's we bring everybody in a in, together in a room, but in fact. Um, you know, civil society is not really listened to or, um, you know, industry is not listened to, etc. But I think we have got examples where multi-stakeholder approaches 
um, being applied to internet governance, and I'll give you examples of cybersecurity in a moment, actually have opened up political systems and political processes in countries where, who are, where it's conducive. Um, so, you know, in a country like South Africa, we actually have strong administrative justice laws, etc., that require participation and consultation. Um, and yet some of the consultation has not been as effective or as really inclusive as it's been in countries with far less, um, you know, formally democratic um, processes and systems. Um, and that's not to set this up ex entirely against um, Kenya, but I think Kenya is a very interesting example where multi-stakeholderism over the last decade has really used to open up the, the policy process where um, civil society has been very, very active and appointed in official positions, um, you know, leading to the first internet governance forum being held in Africa, being held in, in Kenya. Um, so through Kiktonet, through the civil society organization, there's been formal input into policy processes. Um, there's also been a very active um, enabling environment created through this process um, for industry. Obviously, a lot of that industry, um, in terms of local indigenous industry, is small-scale startup. Um, and one of the issues in, in this multi-stakeholder debate and representation at the national level is, you know, which industry is it? Because many of our industries across Africa are actually foreign controlled. And of course, one wants to create an enabling environment in which we can get investment and uh, get opportunities. But it's also, you know, a question of uh, national sovereignty and what um, safeguards need to be made, you know, in terms of our own things. So I think there is a, there is a very real tension between um, uh, many African governments' perspective on national sovereignty and the multi-stakeholder model. That it can be applied, but actually the responsibility lies with the state. And of course, in uh, you know, uh, underpinning democratic prerogative is the idea that the state is ultimately responsible and responsible for the security of its citizens, which comes to the point of, of, of cybersecurity. So um, I think um, you know the, the, the issue with cybersecurity. I mean, um, you were you were saying I mean the, the you know. Um, basically, we're dealing with a situation now where it's borderless and we're dealing with global economies and we've got to create, you know, working you know, systems throughout these global economies. But in fact, you know, the, the, the point about internet governance and particularly about cybersecurity is that the application is at the national level. And um, again, when one assumes that, um, you know, one's got these um, democratic or, and, or uh, political and economic principles underlying it, um, in actual fact, there are many um, countries in Africa that have um, used uh, uh, cybersecurity and um, the, the responsibility as the state to secure and make safe um, the cyber environment or cyberspace for their citizens um, to um, actually use um, arguments of risk mitigation to, in fact, um, you know, exercise um, uh, you know, repressive measures against their own citizens. Um, rather than, you know, a defense from external states, you know, using it as a form of, 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 of oppression and as a form of, you know, um, privately funded very often surveillance. So, you know, we have, we know that from multilateral agencies' engagements across the continent, as we evolved in capacity building, is that, you know, the first thing for the last five or ten years on government's lists of what we need in terms of capacity building is cybersecurity. And these are many of these governments, obviously not all of them, and I really don't want to generalize, but many governments um, actually are putting this priority above, I'm not saying it shouldn't be a priority, it has to be done with everything else, but it's, you know, people jump to capacity building for that and not for, you know, autonomous regulation or, um, you know, spectrum, um, efficient spectrum use or all sorts of things, it's because with that, their security um, structures and intelligence structures are, are, are supported and surveillance systems are implemented. So I think we need to, you know, use this multi-stakeholder practice to, um, you know, um, get those good practices um, Im imbued through uh, regional organizations that we have in the region and, of course, um, through the African Union, who has put out several documentations, uh, uh, you, you know, several guidelines, etc., which have not been um, endorsed by all member states. Very difficult to get endorsement of member states, either of the um, Convention on Cybersecurity mm -hmm. and, more particularly, on the Declaration of Internet um, Rights for Africa, the African Declaration of um, Internet Rights. Um, so, um, th you know, th that being said, you, c you, you have a situation where um, the national, the implementation at the national level, um, which is, uh, uh, you know, might be uh, presented as a, an effort to comply with international um, regulations, etc., cetera, um, is, is used for, for far more negative purposes. And in this regard, I think it's quite important to try and get these 
um, security measures, often mirroring and you know, really policy laundering um, some of the um, cybersecurity practices and, and, and laws from, from the West, from the you know, Northern Hemisphere, um, in, out, out of the intelligence and security um, you know, clusters and implementation, or at least joined with justice and um, you know, more broadly safety um, kind, of in, kind of environments. Um, so, in relation to, to public private interplay, uh, um, in, in relation to um, cybersecurity and, and the implementation of multi stakeholder type models, I wanted to say that there are a number of examples on, on the continent. Um, and we've basically uh, we've been working on a paper that looks at um, public private interplays as a, um, in, in, the, in the case of Mauritius, where a very successful um, uh, cyber security and um, critical information infrastructure um, regulation and, and governance framework was set up, um, leveraging the uh, capacity, particularly of the f very strong financial sector there, which had obviously sorted out security issues, you know, um, decades ago, or at least a decade ago in this area, um, to secure their own systems. So very strong partnerships. Um, acknowledging the lack of capacity within, within government, the specialized capacity within government, not relinquishing the role of the state to provide an enabling environment um, and a legislatively enabling environment for this public-private interplay to take place, not abdicating responsibilities, but coordinating um, activities around creating secure environments and ag agreed roles and, and um, functions in terms of mitigating risk um, and... and um, uh, creating a, you know, a, a whole lot of things, including awareness of people. So within this um, paradigm, which we've looked into with other countries and are trying to extend across other countries, there are very clear roles for the state in creating an enabling environment. There's a very clear role for industry in bringing in the expertise that it has, um, and obviously also in the, in the area of awareness, but also a very critical role for um, civil society, who are often at the forefront of creating um, awareness around uh, privacy um, and surveillance and various um, other things. So we, as part of our research, do, we do nationally representative household surveys um, across a number of countries and have included, for the first time, some, some, some cyber um, rights and cyber awareness issues. And, you know, um, really what we see is a con you know, an extension of the digital divide, really sort of digital rights divide, um, where people are absolutely unaware of the rights that they um, are able that they should they should have or ca could in assert, but they just simply aren't aware of them in terms of privacy, and um, also that uh, uh, you know that obviously states have a critical role where we have high levels of digital inequality to play a role, but that there are other components that can fulfil the deficits we have. Thank you so much, Alison, for for giving us that perspective. Uh, I'd like to um, turn to the audience now and um, ask you to pose any questions that you may have to the audience, um, as well as if, if you have examples that you would like to share. If I may ask you to be brief, and uh, as you take the mic, if you could introduce yourself and, um, and um, state the question. If, if there's a particular member of the panel you'd like to direct it to, please, please say so. What I'd like to do is collect a couple uh, and then come back to the panel. Um, can you keep your hand, hand so I can see them? Uh, could I come to um, Mr. Painter first over there and then I'm gonna go over in the back and yeah, thanks, Chris. Uh, yeah, thanks to all the panelists. I'm Chris Painter. I used to be in the government. I now left the government of the US. Uh, one, one thing, um, that I had seen with respect to, uh, and, and the, one of the speakers hit on this, is there seems to be a lot of confusion about what multi-stakeholder means and what, how it applies to cybersecurity uh, because there is a sliding scale. Not everything is totally multi-stakeholder. There are some things around security that are led by governments. And if you create the expectation that everything is completely multi-stakeholder, that just isn't true. Uh, and I had that come up one time when I won't talk about the country we're dealing with here, but a country who we're trying to convince to take a multi-stakeholder view of internet governance said that they were told that that meant that if they were attacked, that they had to consult the multi-stakeholder community before they could respond, which we said was ludicrous. That's not what it meant. But it would be good to work with a multi-stakeholder community to build up your, your capabilities. So, so I think there needs to be more discipline around that. And I do think there's benefits I know when we did our incident response strategy, one of the big benefits that I think wasn't completely mentioned is when you involve the other stakeholders in the process in the beginning, 
you then get buy-in by that community later on, so it validates your actions, uh, and that's been some of my experience. So if anyone has comments on those, I'd appreciate it. Thank you so much. Could I come over to the gentleman over there in the back? Could you introduce yourself and um, state your comment or question? Thank you very much. I'm Huang Da from Chinese Mission, based here, and thank you very much for this inspiring workshop. And uh, yes, uh, have, uh, as you have introduced that uh, when we are talking about cybersecurity, we are talking about many th things. And so I, I want to pick up just one particular thing from, our, uh, from the cybersecurity. It's about international security in the cyberspace. I think it's a different definition from the uh, security of the cyberspace. So um, if we just uh, look at this perspective, we will find that the multi-stakeholder approach have some problem in that it do not have due representatives and it is not effective and uh, it cannot make a very uh, a very um, easy decisions to, to apply to all the countries. So. Um, and uh, there are also some arguments for the multi-stakeholder models that uh, we always said that uh, mm, even though it's traditional international security in the cyberspace, it's just a, a traditional uh, issue, but it faces some differences. The first is a different space, but we also have some uh, uh, international law on the outer space and a high sea is no difference and the second is about it, it is related to new technology, but we all know that uh, to the most security issues in the 20th century will always face new technologies. The government do not need to know how does those weapons or those technologies work. And third is about uh, the, uh, cyber, uh, the international security in the cyberspace affects the civil infra infrastructure. And, uh, but we all know that security issues are always affect the in civil infra infrastructure. So what do you think is the um, differences between the uh, international security, traditional international security problem, and the international security problem in the cyberspace. And uh, do you think that the multilateral approach will be much more effective in the international security in the cyberspace issue? Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll take one more question and I'm going to come back over, over there in the back. Someone's been edging to uh, take the mic. Could you introduce yourself and state your comment or question, please? Thank you very much. So um, my name is Dr. Driart el -Shane. I'm a university professor and of computer sciences in Pristina and Kosovo. And um, I would like to stress this issue of uh, the defining cybersecurity, actually. Um, government has adopted a cybersecurity strategy, but we, we see that um, there is an issue in defining cybersecurity because um, uh, there are some spe special issues in cybersecurity, which is, for example, the email security. And, uh, you know, I've been telling my students that we're using emails completely wrong, and because we should use digital signatures and digital certificates and encryption. Um, for example, today we have uh, all email servers around the world uh, across the internet cyberspace that uh, don't accept unencrypted connections by default. So uh, we need that kind of end-to-end -end encryption by default and um, uh, the strategies and regulations, um, uh, they, they, must, uh, they, they must also imply this. So we need an end-to-end -end encryption so, so that email security, um, emails would be rejected if there is no um, an encryption. So then we need software certificates, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I think um, in terms of stakeholders and the multi-stakeholder approach, I think that users um, have a great uh, have a great play to uh, have a great um, stake to play, and uh, they need to be educated more. And uh, so there is a need for better education. And also, uh, when we speak about public policies and cybersecurity, education is of utmost importance. So one strategy cannot englobe all of these issues. And then there is the, the roles of that the ISPs have in the cyberspace. So. What are your comments? The question is for the, the whole panel. What, what are your comments on all of these um, issues that I mentioned? And how do you think um, we should tackle those issues? Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that question. I think uh, digging deeper into some of these questions, we, could, we would be here all week. Um, but perhaps I'd like to um, see if anyone wants to take, I think there was a particularly interesting question in the back, and I think but the tension between multilateral approaches and multi-stakeholder approaches. And I wonder whether I could uh, put Ambassador Fikin on the, on the spot there, if you don't mind, on the, uh, any, any comments on that um, particular issue. The mic is rebelling. <laughs> 
Ah, we're on. I had a feeling you might come to me for that one. So I was trying to think of a really good answer. Um, look, I think maybe what I'll do is I'll blend Chris's point and kind of question at the end with um, the, the comments from our colleague at the back um, about discipline around multi-stakeholderism. Um, and sometimes there is a place for it and sometimes there are parts where governments are probably best suited to try and sort out some issues. And, and I think, you know, when we do get into the international security environment, um, there are issues that governments are probably going to be best placed um, to deal with um, uh, the, the state on state issues. But, and I say a big but, and I say that with a, a colleague from Microsoft next to me because they make an admirable contribution and have done over the years to trying to um, push governments to think about norms and, and international law quite clearly. Um, and, and that's incredibly useful. And, and to be frank, that's something we've seen over history as well. Whenever you, you know, if you look at multilateralism over the years, it's not always just been the domain of governments. Yes, governments make the end decisions, but they've been heavily influenced by NGOs, by third parties, by academia, um, and a whole range of groups. So it's, you know, it's, it, it, it's not going to give you an easy answer. Yes, there are certain areas of international security where governments will make the final decision, but we will certainly have a conversation and, and be influenced by a range of stakeholders. And maybe that you know, also corresponds to, to other statements that have been made about the, you know, the, the infrastructure in which we're dealing with being owned by the private sector as well. That, that does mean that there are a broader set of considerations that we do have to think about. But the imperative is on our states to, if you like, get ourselves sorted <laughs> in this space. Sorry to simplify it, but you know, there is a real pressure on us now to sit around a table and, and kind of really get some uh, progress on the great work we've done through UN GGEs in the past and, and build on the agreements that we've made. Um, and, and, you know, that, that pressure is felt acutely, I think, amongst um, states. And, but it, it won't be done in a complete um, mm. absence of influence from other parties. Yeah. Thank you very much. And see, Amit wanted to make a comment as well. Yeah. Please go I, ahead. I, I, I want to jump in and just um, focus us again that uh, the, the context that we're discussing here is uh, that we understand that states have a role in domestic cybersecurity and we caution them that when they progress in that role before we take the international discussion they should uh, uh, study the implications and the roles of the multi-stakeholder model and the lessons we've learned in other areas of ICT and the other thing that we need to take into account uh, is that um, uh, when states do that, the thing that they have to take into account here is that they need to be interoperable with other states doing exactly the same. So they should be cautious twice. Once, because they need to take into account the interests of uh, everybody in their community using this, uh, this space for innovation. And uh, also the way this can affect the way their, their uh, I would say, um, civil society organizations, corporations, interact with the global market and with global partners. And I, I, I completely uh, take into account that the rule of law issue is something that we have to uh, take into account, but I think that in any type of relationship between private actors, between private public actors, if there's no trust, because in the case of government, the rule of law is not uh, completely um, 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 obeyed to, then this will make the security mission in cyberspace very difficult because private organizations interfacing with government will be very, very hesitant. So I completely agree about the institutional um, preconditions that we assume, but I think that we don't have a choice, and actually the governments that will make um, difficult choices here have to take into account the price they themselves will pay in carrying out their public function in this space. Thank you very much. And I think from, um, I, I'm now putting on a hat of, uh, of a civil society, being a civil society entity myself, um, and we are, I think we're all learning together, and I think something that Chris said was about, uh, you know, that stri struck a chord with me, which is about when do you get involved? So from a civil society perspective, often it sounds like we're saying we need to be involved in all conversations all the time when it comes to cybersecurity, but that's not necessarily the case. And I think it's important to, um, uh, to say that, you know, we see ourselves in the, uh, from a civil society perspective, because I don't see anyone here on the panel who represents that view, so I'm just going to kind of abuse my uh, role as the moderator to say that there is a key role for non-governmental actors, especially in the, in the shaping the social contract around how, when it comes to an actual cyber incident, 
we've already agreed on the basis, we've already agreed on the principles, so that then the, the relevant actors who have to deal with the incident can take the, uh, can take the responsibility that they need to take. But we're definitely not saying, you know, we need to be in that room uh, discussing with the CERT what is it that they need to do in the next 24 hours while they're dealing with incident responses. So just wanted to put that out there. Um, so unfortunately, we've come to the end of our, our session at uh, how the time flies when you're having fun. Um, so what, I, what I'd like to just do is ask uh, each of our panelists to offer any, any kind of takeaway points or quick remarks and if, if we can keep it brief to uh, one, one minute and, uh, and see if there is anything that you can offer to, to the audience as uh, takeaways in, uh, in kind of, um, on the topic. And I, I'd come to, uh, li like to come to Jan first and, uh, and go around kind of gearing closer to, to myself. So I'm going to end with Jan. So I'll, I'll be go very, on. very brief. Um, Cybersecurity is a shared responsibility. And I think you need, uh, we, we need to collectively ensure that um, uh, all relevant stakeholders are, are, uh, are involved in, in, in actually tackling these, these challenges. And that certainly puts um, the first responsibility on industry in order to make sure that products and services are built in a secure manner, maintained in a secure manner. It, it, it does require collaboration between public and private sector um, on, on, a, on, a, on a range of issues, both at the national and the international level. Um, and ultimately, I think, as, as was said by, by, uh, by others, um, that, that process then needs to be uh, informed um, and in some cases advanced by, by the broader multi-stakeholder community. But, but uh, I think the point here is, is well taken that there are, there are uh, times and scenarios when um, you simply need to have a particular actor um, take, take action in, in, in a particular case. So it's, it's, it, it, is, it is not sort of a one-size-fits-all model, I would, I would say. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ambassador Freakin. Um, I'll, I'll say um, multi-stakeholderism, it's an imprecise term, um, but one that we're working hard to try and embody and, and, and define, but it's vital. And I think really it's about putting your hand up as a government and saying, look, we simply don't have all the answers in such a complex domain that covers so much of broader society. So it's about saying we don't have the answers, but we're willing to engage and incorporate other thinking in, in the positions mm -hmm. that we take. Thank you very much. And Alison, any last remarks there? From Thank you. you. Yes, I mean, I, I think we, it is actually just an acknowledgement of the um, uh, in, you know, in, in equal situations that we have, the lack of capacity we have across different, thing, different parts of the, the, the com uh, countries that we um, have to draw on the, all the resources that there are in the country. We have to harness all those resources. And, uh, you know, just in terms of best practice, in terms of good governance, um, drawing all, as many people as you can, as drawing your citizenry into the decision-making process um, and your, when I say your citizenry, your different sectors into that decision-making process is going to give you the best outcomes um, mm -hmm. so that you can participate more effectively in... Um, representing your national interests and representing your regional interests, representing um, your, yourself and engaging in multilateral um, decisions from an informed and inclusive basis. Mm. Thank you very much. Amit, any last words from you? Yeah, thank you. So uh, I think what we try to show here is that the multi-staker mo model should uh, evolve to fit the different contexts of the different relationships that the government has in cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. And then when, when we do that, we are doing this in an international forum. So we, mm -hmm. we think that there are shared uh, lessons and shared values that we can learn from structuring the discussion domestically. And this will help us move the discussion in the next phase in a bottom-up manner to the international sphere as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. And last but not least, Jonah, over to you. Uh, yeah, I think we wrap us up. Yeah, we're finishing right on time. Um, so I'll just reiterate what, uh, what others have said. Um, you know, I think the multi-stakeholder approach um, is not a one-size-fits-all uh, mm -hmm. approach. There are uh, different iterations of it, uh, different, um, different forms of it that can fit for different uh, types of cybersecurity challenges. Um, you know, I think it's just important to keep in mind that um, you know, having a process that is open, that is transparent, um, that's inclusive, that uh, is stakeholder driven and that's consensus based really can um, go a long way towards getting buy-in um, and helping, uh, you know, make progress on some of these collective action problems that we're all facing. So, um, you know, it's not a silver bullet, but uh, it certainly is a, um, uh, has proven itself to be pretty effective. So. Uh, Mm -hmm. Thanks so much, Jonah. And I'd like to uh, use this opportunity to thank all of my uh, wonderful panelists for offering their thoughts on this important topic. And I'd like to thank the audience for their participation and attendance. So, yeah, thank you very much. And good afternoon.
I, I, was, I was sad that we didn't have, I, I was thinking that there would be another round of questions, but there just wasn't no time. Yeah. By the time, 